Thank you all very much for coming out on what, what turned out to be a pretty rough start to the day. Hopefully it's going to get sunnier and nicer, but I appreciate you all um, you know, charging out into, into uh, such a sort of rotten start to the day. And thank you very much for Kathy and Terry for arranging this and for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk today about something, it's not really a canned lecture. For those of you who've heard me talk a little bit about the Calcolithic, you'll recognize some images for sure. But I'm actually toying with an idea, and so you all are perhaps not really the first guinea pigs, but in the early starting uh, of uh, people that I'm throwing an idea out, and it's, it's an idea that I've been toying with, and so this has sort of pushed me to put it out there and put a little bit more of the idea on paper. Uh, and so if it's not an entirely solidified, convincing argument, that's because it's something I'm still working on, and I hope you'll join me in thinking about these ideas. And uh, it's something that I, I do get excited about. Uh, the economy, of course, is never something that's far from the news, but of course now it's really a constant hot topic and will have an important uh, impact on the upcoming midterm elections, I would imagine. I'm not an economist, and so you can imagine that I approach such a large, complicated topic with a bit of trepidation. What could a mere archaeologist, a field dirt archaeologist at that, and one who specializes in prehistoric societies have to say on the topic? Well, as it turns out, not much, particularly when it comes to modern economic woes, or much less solutions. Still, the workings of ancient eco econo economies was a key reason that I started down the rocky, frequently congested path towards archaeology. I became interested in the reasons behind the transition from relatively egalitarian societies to those with non-egalitarian social structures, that is, those that have elites and non-elites, the haves and the haves not have-nots. The reasons that archaeologists and anthropologists have offered for this fundamental change in human history are many, but really they can be grouped into two large sets, those that see it as economic and those that see it as political. In the economic model, archaeologists posit, they suggest, that an imbalance in population and resources was the root cause, that more people pressing against diminishing resources resulted in the exchange from different areas, in turn leading to those who gain from this trade, from specialization to feed the trade, and so on. The political model centers on the actions of aspiring individuals who exploit situations for their own gain. Regardless of which of these models we wish to promote, this is dependent upon economic intensification, because a surplus must be produced in order to move beyond simple subsistence. This is the topic I'd like to explore today. That is, how do archaeologists explain the reasons for economic intensification? Why was there this move away from egalitarian societies where things are relatively equal? Those explanations that I just mentioned are largely economic, revolving around imbalances in population resources or political. These approaches downplay or even ignore what I consider to be one of the key sources of increased economic production, individual and communal ritual participation and performance that often involved the entire population or much of the population. In The Great Transformation, Carl Polanyi pointed out two different meanings of economics. One refers to economics as the logic of rational choice between the different ends of scarce means. The second meaning refers to how humans make a living from their natural and social environment. Put another way, the process of provisioning within specific contexts. That provisioning encompasses both production and acquisition. The second definition is one that's embedded in culture and society. Clearly, major distinctions between economic and social or political experience or between rational and irrational behavior is not an accurate portrayal of how society works. There are no universal and invariant rules. There are no natural laws of economics, such as you might find in mathematical physics or, or microbiology. This is particularly true of small-scale societies. And by small-scale societies, I mean those ranging from several hundred to several thousand people in size. And they're characterized by relatively uncentralized political systems. Small-scale societies, such as the Neolithic societies across the Near East, were by no means homogenous, nor was there an absence of social complexity. But in the period that we will look at for our case study today, we can see the beginnings of socioeconomic differentiation long-distance trade and prestige goods, and limited evidence, anyway, that suggests the emergence of some hierarchy, some political leadership. 
And that's what we're trying to get at today is why did this emerge? So first, what do we mean by social complexity? Any human group is complex, of course, and true egalitarianism, where everybody is really equal regardless of age or sex, that's absent. That doesn't exist and probably never did exist. Status distinctions and hierarchy are not limited to human groups even, but found in a range of other animals as well. Certainly primates have hierarchies as well as other animals. But by complexity, I mean the process of qualitatively and quantitatively increasing interdependence and hierarchical organization of social groups and their economic, political, ritual, and administrative structures. Key to this being possible is agriculture. It is one of the keys to the rise of social complexity. That is, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Agriculture does not automatically lead to social complexity. Greater complexity requires energy in order to support specialists and elites, and it supports increased economic activity. There are, however, rare exceptions where greater social complexity arose among societies where subsistence is not based on agriculture, but instead on rich marine resources. And of course, I'm thinking, for instance, of some of the Northwest groups, traditional Northwest uh, Native American groups along uh, the, the, the Northwest coast, uh, present day Washington, British Columbia, Oregon. The agricultural intensification frees some people from full-time farming, and from this, specialists emerge. Things such as metal workers, potters, tanners, wood bake, woodworkers, bakers, etc., depending on historical contingency, different cultures. Now, craft specialization is going to be a central topic to looking at this change and this economic intensification, this case study that we'll look at today. And the archaeological recognition of craft specialists is not always easy to recognize. Uh, it's particularly when you're looking at small-scale societies. When looking at complex states, when looking at the state in Mesopotamia or in Egypt, where you see separate precincts for workshops and they're easy to identify, well, I shouldn't say easy, but much more clear, uh, and the technology that's required for these workshops to operate requires investment and resources, the, indi the indicators tend to be much clearer. This is not always a simple matter, however, when we're looking at pre-state societies without the benefits of texts or urban centers where you have these separated residential pre workshop precincts and so on. Well, I apologize for the Anthropology 101 short course this morning, but I thought it useful to establish a few basic ideas about the related factors leading to increased social complexity. Subsistence economy. Subsistence economy, here we have a nice, tidy definition. And this is something that Gil Stein will be talking about in much more depth uh, next week, I believe, next, uh, next Saturday. And so I, I won't um, elaborate on it too much. But today I'd like to argue a different way of looking at the rise of social complexity and economic intensification. For this lecture, our case study will be the Calcolithic period in the Southern Levant, modern, what is now modern day Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. We'll focus our analytical lens on evidence that I will argue is indicative of what I'll call a ritual economy or a ritual mode of production. That is the production of objects that are critical for ritual performance. And the lower uh, definition you see here for ritual economy is what you get when you try to look it up in anthropologists and you end up with a definition that you're not quite sure what they're trying to say. So simply put, it's just the, the production, the economic production necessary to, for ritual performance, for ceremonial rites, to be able to produce the necessary extra food as well as artifacts to go with those ritual performances. This often occurs in a ritual cycle, and this is why Roy Rappaport called it the, uh, mode of, uh, the ritual mode of production. This argument is made in juxtaposition to those arguments which suggest that the increase in economic intensification and social complexity during this period were the results of efforts to deal with population and resource imbalances or the political aspirations of individuals. Uh, these, these, were the, these ideas were what drove me as a graduate student, what drew me into archaeology. I was very much convinced by them, and I've now been sort of moving away from them as I've looked more and more at the data from my dissertation and since then. So instead, I argue that the primary motivation for subsistence intensification and craft specialization in small-scale societies, such as the Calcolithic of the Southern Levant, was to supply the needs of ritual practices for ceremonies. 
So to structure this, we'll look at some of the basic facts of the period under study, and after that, we'll turn to a brief summary of the data that has been used to support this idea that there were non-egalitarian elite place, basically chiefdoms in the Calcolithic. And from that, we'll turn to evidence for the ritual practices during the period and the equipment involved with these. Well, the Calcolithic spans about a thousand years, and we don't really have an internal chronology for that period, unfortunately. It's something we're still working on, but there's about a thousand year period there where we cannot separate it down into smaller increments. At least we can't all agree on it. Some people have their ideas, but we don't need to go there today. In the Southern Levant, this period continues the Neolithic tradition of agricultural communities, already well established across the Near East, of course. The domestication of plants and animals that took place during the Neolithic and the Near East established the foundations for the ability, at least, for surplus production to actually produce more than people needed simply to get by to survive. But despite that ability, it was some millennia that passed before truly ranked hierarchical societies emerged, probably not until the early bronze, some would argue, during the Calcolithic period. So the Calcolithic period of the Southern Levant, which came right after the Neolithic, is thought by some to have had these hierarchical societies. Certainly, there are diverse, elaborate mortuary practices, which uh, for those of you who have heard me lecture before, I've elaborated on uh, at, at some length, and uh, the, the mortuary practices of the period are fascinating, and we'll touch upon them very briefly today. There are also prestige items and evocative imagery that complement the social population, social phenomena such as population growth, settlement hierarchies, that is where you have larger settlements and smaller ones around them, and even the limited craft specialization. Yet, the typical trappings of chiefdoms, of hierarchical societies, things like monumental architecture, elaborate mortuary displays, elite controlled craft production, and large storage areas that are limited to only access for some of the population, these things are absent in the Calcolithic. So it's not a clear example where we have chiefdoms, elites, versus everybody else. There's still some argument about this. What we can agree upon is that during the Calcolithic, most people were sedentary agro-pastoralists. That is, they had sheep, they had goat. In the northern areas, they had pigs, um, they had cows. They lived in large and small villages. Um, pigs, again, uh, in some of the better watered areas. There was still some hunting in the very far south reaches where you couldn't actually practice agriculture. So down in the Sinai, southern Negev, modern southern Jordan, there was still some hunting going on. But for the most part, people were practicing agriculture and had uh, sheep, goat, cattle, and pigs in the more uh, well-watered areas. The intensification of production during this period is clear. The details about the practices such as things like olive production are still being worked out. We're still arguing over some of these details. But there's a dramatic increase in status goods and the increase in craft production is also clear. For instance, the basalt bowls. The basalt bowls, something I studied for my dissertation, it could be a whole nother lecture that you should can count yourselves lucky that you're not having to listen to right now, um, are a, a, a wonderful example where people invested a lot of energy in making a calcolithic basalt bowl such as that. That thing, which, I don't know, a lot of museums don't like to use scales for some reason. Um, so that, that is about a half meter tall. So almost up to my knee made out of a solid basalt boulder using stone tools somehow. There were copper tools. A copper tool would last about one minute against this hard basalt. So they did this with stone tools. All of the intricate detail is um, difficult to estimate how long it would have taken somebody to make one of these. And I still hope that um, I, I will have the opportunity to push a graduate student into trying to make one of these, or two of these, with a graduate student. I always thought I was going to do it, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. We'll need to actually make stone tools, at, you know, following the ancient tradition, and then try to make one of these. So I would estimate, though, that something as elaborate as that would probably take a couple of weeks to make, unless that's all you're doing all the time. Simpler basalt bowls such as these are still quite beautiful, despite my rather pathetic picture of them. It's rather fuzzy, I recognize. Uh, these are, again, um, this one is nearly as tall as this one, nearly a half meter tall. So these are being made out of basalt. Basalt is from the Golan and the Galilee. So the, where these were found in the Negev, the, the basalt is not local. Somebody traveled a couple days away to get the basalt. And that's actually all we know about the production of these. 
And that's a problem when you want to talk about economics, of course. If you're not talking about production, you have a problem on your hands, and I'll be the first to admit it. So it's clear that people are investing a lot of energy, getting the resources, spending a lot of time manufacturing these basalt bowls, and then taking them back, because we don't think they're being made on the villages. We've got no evidence of the tools or the detritus from their manufacture. So this suggests that there's a great investment in making these. And yet, you can already tell they're not very standardized. This one is much more elaborate than most that we find. And others, um, the more simple forms, still are not really a basic size. They, they, some flare out more than others, some are squatter. They're not very standardized. And this is what led me, actually, from studying these in my dissertation, to sort of, sort of start looking at where are these showing up and why aren't they more standardized? If this is craft specialization, why aren't they sort of being more efficient about how these are manufactured? But really, the, the way to really talk more about uh, craft production is the sophisticated copper smelting uh, during the Calcolithic. This clearly attests to skilled craft production. And this is something we'll return to. Ivory working as well has some element of craft specialization, although there aren't that many ivory objects. Uh, they're clearly very nicely done, and some, I would argue, are very evocative of pre-dynastic Egyptian forms. I would suggest that that one looks very much like a Bedarian uh, type. I'm not sure that all my Egyptological um, colleagues would agree with me on that. It's a tough thing to sort out. It would really help if we had the head, but we don't. Others are probably not, probably not Egyptian inspired, but locally manufactured uh, ivory pieces coming from the Nile, hippo ivory coming from some distance. These are just a few examples of social valuables, the conspicuous consumption of today's title. Such items represent objects outside of the subsistence economy. How do these objects relate to the economies of village life 6,000 years ago? First, I think we should bear in mind that these valuables are not simply tokens of prestige. The demand for these types of objects inspires and motivates the intensity and the scale of craft production in small-scale societies. Just as an annual rite such as Halloween inspires the intensity of costume and candy production on an annual basis, so economic intensification was linked to increases in the elaboration and frequency of communal and individual ceremonial activity. Of course, there is an important difference. And uh, many of these Calcolithic ceremonies probably would have been viewed as an obligation. I'm not so sure that any of us would really consider Halloween an obligation, at least uh, not, not now. Um, the impact of ritual practice on economic production has long been recognized in the anthropological literature. So I'm certainly not the first by any means to suggest that ritual practices and ceremonies would draw and actually push economic production. One of my own anthropology professors at the University of Virginia when I was an undergraduate, uh, Fred Damon, has documented how mortuary requirements in the Massim region, which is in the South Pacific, motivated an enormous amount of time, effort, and resources for communal mortuary rites. And even Bronislaw Malinowski, in his early work among the Trobrands, noted the large economic impact of communal ceremonies within a ritual cycle. People would start manufacturing canoes and large stone tools, axes that you couldn't actually use, they were too large, they were too thin, for this ritual cycle in, in ramping up the production for ceremonies. Similar observations, as I've already mentioned, led Roy Rappaport to coin this term, ritual mode of production, in which he suggests that the ritual cycle defines and gives meaning to the social and political and ecological relations. Conspicuous consumption events such as the potlatch or the kula ring uh, which you see an example of here, differ from our own conspicuous consumption in at least one fundamental way. And I think this is important to keep in mind. For, for us, for modern industrial societies, amassing wealth and status items, that's the conspicuous part, what you have, right? What you drive, uh, what you're wearing. But kula, or potlatch, or even the mocha events, if any of these ring familiar, these are events to amass wealth and give it away. So the conspicuous consumption of those is the very public giving away of all of it as opposed to keeping it. These and other ethnographic studies allow us to look at the social valuables of the Calcolithic from a different perspective. The general economic intensification evident during this period and the related craft specialization is not produced for ordinary everyday consumption. Instead, craft specialization and long distance trade provide valued objects that are distinguished from other material items. <clears throat> 
Anthropologists, of course, have long noted that economic institutions are not separate from the cultural realm, and particularly among the, the often traditional or folk societies in which they work. Yet archaeologists, as opposed to anthropologists, archaeologists still tend to dichotomize material culture of, of past societies into two categories, subsistence and wealth. Wealth is associated with elites, and subsistence is what people in small-scale societies had to settle for. So let us look at some of these socially valued goods operating within what I consider the ritual economy of the Calcolithic. First, I'll turn to the most obvious example of craft specialization, metallurgy. The Calcolithic period, of course, is named after the recognition that copper smelting begins during this time. Calco is copper, lithic is stone. And it's a technological sophistication that's unparalleled in, their, in neighboring areas, such as Egypt at this time. The Egyptians were not uh, pro producing sophisticated metals like this at this time. They did not have the technology available, even though very soon after the Calcolithic, they really sort of shot forward in terms of social complexity well over what was going on in Palestine and uh, the environs. <clears throat> just, uh, just the general area, of course. So set in a remote cliff, to the west of the Dead Sea, the Nahal Mishmar Cave is truly spectacular, and I've mentioned this in uh, lectures before. It's, it's extraordinary because there are not other hordes like this in the region. Um, it's, it contained the famous treasure of exotic and labor-intensive crafted artifacts of copper and ivory, as well as some pottery and a few other items. You can see it here in the crevice where it was found with the, um, the mat, the reed mat that was put together that this whole bundle was put together in this crevice. When it was found originally, in fact, there was some doubt as to how it could possibly be the Calcolithic. The copper was too beautiful, too sophisticated. It was beyond anything that was known locally. It was beyond anything that the Egyptians were doing at the same time. So how could it be that these, these, these agriculturalists uh, with a few pieces of nice pottery and a few pieces of ivory, how was it that they had this? There was some doubt. Recently, this mat was redated, and it's only about, I guess it was published about six years ago or something like that. So they did, you know, very high precision mass spectroscopy type of radiocarbon dating. So redating uh, the several different pieces of this mat, and it put it solidly in the Calcolithic. In fact, pushed the date earlier. So really into the Calcolithic, not, no chance that it's early bronze. This is very interesting. It's very strange that it's up in this crevice. So there are over 400 copper artifacts primarily mace heads and scepters. The remarkable hoard provides insights not only to the sophisticated copper techniques, but also the elaborate iconography of the hoard. These range from birds, ibex horns, to, um, uh, I, I should mention that ibex horns are really a, a common theme in the Calcolithic uh, context, very often in mortuary context. And some of the birds even seem to be inspired by, I would argue, um, Egyptian motifs. Again, that's something that's very difficult to demonstrate one way or the other. A bird is a bird, perhaps, but some of these do look like they, uh, particularly this one, looks very similar to some of the Egyptian motifs to my eye. Other motifs are difficult to interpret. They appear to possibly be vegetal motifs. Others combine the animal horns with tools or handled vessels. And so you can see how we have elaborate iconography combining the, the ibex horns with like a blade, an axe. Over here we have things that also might be axes but maybe a vegetal motif on the top, something that is maybe like a mace head or again possibly vegetal. These may be even mimicking basketry but again in copper. Again these with these nice strap handles. This stuff is extraordinary in that it is the lost wax casting method of metal the Sierpia do. So this is not something that was uh, common. And we're not even sure where all of the copper is coming from. Some of it is probably not coming from local sources in the present day Jordan or Israel. It's probably coming from somewhere in the north. It has not been pinpointed. And there is not agreement on where that copper is coming from. Because there are higher um, trace elements of arsenic and, and timony in that copper, that do not match the sources in the south that are in Wadi Fainan and other areas in the far south. So it, this sophisticated technology is probably also drawing in metal ores from other areas. And this hints at trade and exchange over uh, a fairly great distance. The Mishmar Horde also included some ivories. Uh, the ivories, uh, these are hippo ivory, 
And this one, I believe, is hippo ivory, but uh, I'm not sure that that's actually been confirmed by the, the, the only ivory expert that it ever seems to work in the area. There, there, a few have been identified as elephant, and uh, so I don't know if there really is any elephant, but most is hippo ivory. And uh, hippo is probably coming from the Nile. So what's this hoard doing here? Archaeologists have proposed different reasons that this incomparable deposit was left in a remote cliff face. Uh, and I should point out that you saw where it was in that cliff face. They had to rappel down the, the Israeli military and archaeologists sort of built rope ladders and rappelled down the cliff face to even get in that crevice. So it, it was not, even though there was some pottery that wasn't particularly glamorous and so some people suggested they were maybe living in this cave, this seems pretty hard to believe that anybody was living up there. Most archaeologists would agree on the cultic or the ritual nature of the deposit, the, the motifs, the fact that it's all hoarded together and placed in this crevice. So most archaeologists would agree on that. However, they've proposed different reasons about why it was in that crevice hidden away like that. And we don't really have time to go into all of these different theories, but one of them uh, is, is overlooked, and that is that there were human burials up there, and at least one of them seems to be directly associated with that hoard. So although it seems like an awfully elaborate burial, you know, funerary um, uh, context, it, nevertheless, there are human burials there, and so that may be the reason. So this, this is a, a, a point that's been ignored, that there were the skeletons found in the cave where the hoard was found. So whether or not this should be interpreted as a burial assemblage, there's little, um, there's little doubt that ultimately it was associated with ritual practices of some sort. Well, now I'd like to turn to, we were just looking at the hoard, which is right down here. Here you have the Dead Sea. What we were just looking at was Nahal Mishmar, uh, the, the so-called cave of the treasure. And now we're going to jump over here and we're going to look at the site of Gilat. Gilat doesn't look like much. There's no impressive monumental architecture. There's really not a lot to point at here. You can see the traces of a mud brick building, maybe a stone platform, some nice large cars, and a whole lot of pits. Boy, did we hate the pits. The mud brick wasn't much fun either, but the pits were horrible. Because there were so many of them, they're cutting across each other, and you can't really tell which one came first or what belongs in what pit. Um, so a few pits, archaeologists love them. You find all sorts of goodies in pits. You find preserved animal remains, preserved botanical remains. You find goodies, you know, nice artifacts that are hidden away. Uh, but when you have too many pits and they cut over each other, you start to not have much of a comprehensive architectural plan. That causes some problems for us. And uh, the, the site is now published. And uh, you can see that uh, back in the old days, we didn't really seem to have very good consciousness of um, uh, the need for wearing clothes when you're <laughs> excavating and protecting yourself from the sun. Gilat's a moderately sized site as well. It's nothing extraordinarily large. It doesn't have monumental architecture. And it's located at the interface between the northern Negev and that coastal plain, that humid coastal plain. The architecture and the stratigraphy, as I said, is rather disturbed. The plan is less than coherent. But the assemblage from Gilat is remarkably rich. A lot of it comes from the pits. The Gilat Lady and the Gilat Ram are the most famous, most well-known symbols locally. Every archaeologist has known of them for quite some time. And uh, of course, the Gilat Lady has inspired quite a number of articles. She's just the kind of thing archaeologists like to wax philosophical about. And uh, of course, there's a lot of imagery there to talk about. The vessel that she has on her head is what's called a churn. And the churn is actually missing the neck. So there should be a little bit more of a neck right up at the top. And it's a miniature of a vessel that we know well. and was probably used for making butter and yogurt. So there you have a vessel that was probably pretty crucial to agricultural society, sitting atop the head of the Gilat lady, uh, clearly a lady, um, although somewhat barrel-shaped. Uh, I would disagree with most of archaeologists who have asserted that she's a symbol of fertility because she's pregnant. My anthropological colleagues don't necessarily agree that she's uh, pregnant. And, um, it's a tough one to know one way or the other, of course. She could be barrel-shaped because this is how you build an, a, a vessel. She's hollow in the inside, and so the, the, a certain amount of uh, barrel shapeness probably helps the structural integrity of making this hollow uh, anthropomorphic figurine. We don't know exactly what it is she has under her arm. Uh, she does have a very nice little stool. Some have argued that it's like a birthing stool, which we know from much, much later Hittite uh, iconography, so it doesn't mean that that's what this is. Uh, 
It could just be a stand that you put a cult ritual object on. We do have parallels actually in copper for very similar shaped objects. And uh, well, if you really want to wax philosophical, you could probably make an argument that these are sort of the furrows of the field and her tears are dry, you know, glowing in and watering the fields for fertility. I'm not sure I'd really go that far, but you can tell somebody and I have already argued about this. And here you have the ram with uh, also typical vessels in its back. So this is what the site of Gilad is particularly well known for. These are, those are extraordinary objects. They're not known from other sites. But the, this, the, the assemblage from Gilat is quite rich in other ways, and so it includes a large number of stone mace heads, and I had the, the good luck of uh, getting to study those um, as, a, as a graduate student. There's an extraordinarily large number of them for a site. On any Calcolithic site, you might be lucky enough to find one or two. We had about 40 stone mace heads at the site, and uh, a few of them, I would argue, are very similar to pre-dynastic shapes. Um, this is a more typical calcolithic shape, this sort of piriform or pear-shaped. Um, these are not very typical and are actually not known from pretty much any other sites. They're, these are also not made of local materials, nor are these pallets. This is granite and this is scoria. Scoria is volcanic, probably coming from somewhere up in the Galilee or the Golan, up where the volcanoes were. And granite is either coming from Sinai or somewhere in the southern Negev, southern Jordan. Again, not local to the site. And then the obsidian which we used neutron activation analysis. We found six pieces of obsidian, and of course we took photographs of the nice ones, the best pieces. And these six pieces were traced to three different sources in Anatolia, so well over 1,000 kilometers away. Now these are very small, and those could sort of be the function of down the line trade. You could have, you could very easily envision some nomadic pastoralists sort of trading it from, uh, amongst different people and it sort of finally making its way down. It doesn't necessarily mean the people in this village made their way to different volcanic sources in modern day Turkey. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a very long way. Now typically in my lectures, I've always said that these are unique uh, to the Calcolithic period with the exception of one piece we know from another site. However, this year we found two more pieces of obsidian at our site, Marjraba, up in the north. So I'm very excited about being able to trace those two pieces we just discovered this summer and find out if they're from the same sources as these or somewhere else. And, uh, and I've even got a colleague who's volunteered to do the testing for free, so it doesn't get much better than that. And got a permit to take them out of the country. So um, all of these asides aside, what else did we find at Kilat? We found hundreds of ceramic and basalt fenestrated stands. We call them fenestrated for the obvious reason, of course, they have windows. And they've been traditionally called incense burners. There's not really a good reason to interpret them that, that way functionally. I mean, it's a nice name for them, incense burners. It makes a lot more sense than calling them fenestrated pedestal stands. Um, but we don't really know that they were burning in the incense. And a lot of them, as you can see, are not burned. Uh, they are um, not very practical in many ways. And so they might be nice for perhaps burning an incense um, or keeping an oil hot, but we don't have a lot of evidence for burning. At, at the site of Gilat, we've got evidence for about hundreds of them. And again, this one is basalt, so it's coming from several days away that this basalt, and we have more of these at the site of Gilat than any other site in the southern Levant. So we have hundreds of those. The mollusk shell sample is much larger than for most other sites. It includes species such as Aspatheria rubens, it's a species from the Nile, uh, another species called Truncata, which is from the Red Sea, as well as others from the Mediterranean. So the site is bringing in shell from different water sources. It's bringing in basalt from distant northern or eastern sources. And then we have the violin-shaped figurines, the lovely violin-shaped figurines. Now, if you study the Aegean a bit, you immediately look at them and go, wait a minute, but those look a lot like, you know, these are later, however. These are a good thousand years later than those ones you know from the uh, Cycladic Islands. And uh, so probably not, not related because these are some of the earliest that we know of in the southern Levant. Again, at this site we have, I've forgotten now, what is the number, 76. 76 of these things from the site of Gilat. That number, 76 of them, is more than have been found at all other sites from Lebanon to Sinai put together. So it's, 76 doesn't sound like an extraordinary number, but in contrast to any other site, it's, it's a lot. And as again, again, you can see that they're made of some exotic materials, granite. Uh, I think this is the one that's made of chlorite schist. And uh, one of my colleagues, my senior colleagues, sort of a mentor, uh, was taken to task for drawing a parallel to the female form with these. And uh, so he was very happy when we later discovered one that he thought helped 
make his case. This is an, a unique example of a violin-shaped figurine. Um, and um, that one, sorry, not the one on the left, but this one is from a different site up in the north. Again, female form seems fair enough. And what, the reason I bring it up in this context is that it seems to have uh, contours that resemble the ossuaries, the burial boxes for secondary burial in the Calcolithic. So you can see how you've got the shoulder and neck very similar, and this seems very similar to the ossuary shoulder, neck, and even the breasts of these ossuaries. So there does seem to be this connection between a clearly ritual artifact and perhaps these uh, ossuary boxes for burial, for secondary burial. But back to Gilat, there are no ossuaries at that site. There are, however, a lot of burials. And um, this one is the, probably the largest, one of the better preserved burials at the site. It's a collective burial. And so there are burials all over the site, an estimated number of about 90 individuals at the site. So burials were primary. They were placed in shallow pits primarily. There were scattered bones in some, you know, ones that had been disturbed or removed. This collective burial is in a shallow mud brick lined pit. And you can just make out the traces of some of the mud brick here still. It was a pretty well made um, pit or silo or even just a burial structure. So it, it might have been initially been intended as a silo, but as a secondary use, it clearly contained the complete skeletons of nine individuals, three adults, three adolescents, and three children. Below, when we excavated very carefully this layer of individuals, we found a layer of animal bones at the bottom of it very thick layer of animal bones. I don't mean just a few animal bones here and there, which we find across the site. A thick layer of sheep goat at the bottom of it, and then below the animal bone of the, of the pit was a nice stone paving. Kind of suggests maybe some sort of associated feasting or something. Difficult to know that this event happened with the animal artifacts at the bottom, with the animal bone at the, at the bottom of the pit. It's tough to know that it was all one event. But just one meter away, we found this, a mud plastered pit, you can just make it out, with a complete basalt fenestrated stand, which you've already seen a picture of actually, and burned gazelle horns. There were something like 12, 12 burned gazelle horns actually, but you can only make out a few in this particular picture. Gazelle horn cords, gazelles are something that's hunted. What were these people who were raising sheep and goat and maybe a few pigs and cows doing with gazelle horn cords? We don't really know. We don't have any evidence that they were hunting. Maybe they were using something that we no longer have traces of for hunting, or maybe they were going out and collecting these. Maybe they were trading with other groups further to the south. We really don't know. Whatever reason, though, it's pretty evocative that they were collecting these, these horn cores, the interior cores of the gazelle, and putting them together in this pit right next, one meter away from that burial structure that had the nine individuals in it. And again, it brings us back to that repeating uh, that redundant motif of horns that are often in association with the fenestrated stands. Now, relative to the area excavated, the burial density at Gilat is much higher than at any other site. In other words, the mortuary rites were a central function of the site. And yet, despite the exotic nature of the artifact assemblage, the population at Gilat really suffered pretty poor health. So it doesn't really seem like it was some sort of elite precinct. We don't really have any evidence for, say, priests or anybody really doing well. So there's very nice objects, things that are being made from materials that are non-local uh, and very evocative artifacts. But it's not, these don't, at least according to the diet, the people who are living there, who were buried there, don't really suggest uh, an elite group of people. Well. The one thing that I can never resist showing is, of course, the dog who was also buried at this site in his own pit. Uh, not only in his own pit, but I mean, literally, this is not just a dead animal, but one that was clearly placed in a burial pit, like some of the other individuals, and had his own mortuary artifact, which actually is clear, more clearly associated with this dog than most of the other human burials at the site. He had his own mortuary vessel. Most of the other humans didn't. Most of the humans did not. Um, Carolyn Grigson, our archaeozoologist, and, and who's been an archaeozoologist for a very long time, said that the dog was very old. She suggested that because the animal had an unhealed fractured leg, it was well cared for for months or even years before it died. And because it's articulated, it was clearly placed there, not sort of just dumped and then scattered somewhere. It was placed in this pit. 
We don't really have parallels for this in the Southern Levant. We don't have any other animal burials this early, uh, certainly not with their own mortuary artifact. Now, we do have some parallels in Egypt uh, at sites like Mahdi and Wadi Digla and Heliopolis. Um, and those are animal burials that are sometimes uh, equipped with offerings, most of them dogs. But they're a little bit later. They're not quite as early as this, as far as I can make out from the literature. So the dog's funerary vessel, that double-handled cylindrical vessel down there, is also quite unusual. And it's locally manufactured, so we can't say that it comes from Egypt. And yet the unusual nature of the uh, vessel is a bit suspicious. Well, that's, that's the site of Gilat. Just recently, some colleagues published a rather interesting paper. And um, this is at the site of Tel Sof. This is in Jordan Valley. Uh, it's actually just south of the Sea of Galilee. I'm not going to talk about it for very long. Uh, I just wanted to mention it. And I mention it because they published a paper just last year arguing that, the, that feasting took place at this site. Now, the large-scale accumulation of food for feasting is well known in the anthropological literature, whether it's yams, huge amounts of yams for bride wealth payments or uh, and to trade within the Kula ring. It's well known uh, phenomena to, to sort of ramp up production of food and not because you need to feed people so much as display of being able to uh, spread the wealth around. This is typically associated with ritual events. And of course, we can make parallels in our own uh, lives as well. This often involves strategic planning for over a year or more. And so food production is intensified for the feast. Now, feasting, of course, may produce the need for other types of ceremonial equipment, whether it's special garments or ornamentation or material goods for display. So here we see the site of Tel Sof, which my colleagues um, published. It's, again, it's uh, just, just south of the, dead, uh, of the Sea of Galilee, very hot area. All the architecture is primarily um, mud brick. And they argue it's a site of feasting. So here you can see a plan of just part of the site. And you see our standard uh, rectilinear or calcolithic building. And then you see some very intriguing circular structures, not typical of uh, calcolithic sites. This site, they suggest, it's, uh, the, the rectilinear architecture and the courtyards have associated with them the hearths and, as well as the hearths, a series of silos. And so in that courtyard area, and from their report, I believe that these are also silos as well, but that that is not and that is not. So their point is, their argument is, is that you have uh, silos being built that are a place to put a lot more food than, what, than met the needs of the people as far as they can estimate. Now, this is a difficult thing to be certain of, you know, how much could be stored in these silos. But it's clear that not very many people would live in a courtyard rectilinear complex like this. And so the suggestion is that these were built for feasting events and that these mini hearths were being used for roasting animals, basically the calcolithic barbecue events. And they found a lot of pig bone in these, in these roasting ovens. Pigs were very popular at the site. It's a very wet area down in the Jordan Valley. And so pigs seem to, I mean, barbecue, it seems to have been what people were drawn to at the site. This is the final point I'd like to mention today. And it's, it's something that, it's, it's an intriguing aspect of the Calcolithic. You really cannot get away from the, the aspect of secondary burial in the period. A major Calcolithic innovation is the introduction of extramural mortuary grounds. So in the Neolithic, very often people were just simply buried under the floor somewhere, probably in a house that they were no longer using or going to abandon. In the Calcolithic, you start to get what I think we can fairly call separate, separate grounds, cemeteries. And those cemeteries are sometimes in caves, and sometimes they're just extra, uh, you know, extra village areas with circles. Along with this practice was secondary inhumation. What is secondary inhumation? Secondary process is where the body is put somewhere for a period of time, and then people return to collect the bones. Maybe not all of them. There's the sort of the largest pieces. It varies culturally uh, for reburial. So it's actually a long ritual cycle. It's actually a long process. Uh, this comes back again in uh, the second, second Temple period. Um, but this is the first time that we really see this as a very standard procedure, is during the Calcolithic when people are starting to practice secondary mortuary practices. These are very often in caves, and they're typically associated with ossuaries. Here you see an ossuary, and this is a karstic cave, so that's why it looks like molten 
uh, molten, I don't know, melted ice cream that's now solidified all over everything. So here you have a ceramic box. This is the top of the box, but it's flipped upside down. And here you see the nose, maybe a headdress, some breasts, and that would have sat on top. These are little um, handles that weren't really for picking it up as much as they were probably for closing the lid, for holding the lid on top. And then this is this horrible environment where my colleagues had to work, chipping all this stuff off of this very soft human remains and artifacts and ossuaries. Very tough environment to work. It was found with a tractor, though they had no choice. It had to be it was a salvage archaeology project. This is just a, a very simple map showing where the ossuaries are, uh, ossuaries are found in caves marked by the red stars and where a few other ossuaries are found very rarely in non-cave sites, just to give you a sense of where these found. Of course, you can already recognize that the concentration is in Tel Aviv and the larger suburban area where a lot of development takes place and where a lot of these caves are discovered with tractors and backhoes and so on when they break open the side of a mountain. They're building a, a suburb uh, complex, and that's when these are discovered. So it's actually quite rare that the archaeologists have the privilege of finding it first before a, a bulldozer does, unfortunately. Um, the Pekin Cave, the one we just looked at, is up in the north, not far from our excavations, Mars Raba. Many of these are known from the coastal plain, as we saw in Central Hill Country. Although this is really touted as the primary mode of calcolithic burial, there's a diverse array of inhumations. So people are not only buried, being buried this way, they're still also being buried singly or multiple burials, as we saw at Gilat, um, rather than secondary burial. Burial goods, though, are usually associated with secondary burials. Most of the burial goods are with secondary burials, and they become much more frequent and elaborate than in periods like the Neolithic, in the earlier periods. But this, this quantity and the quality of goods really varies widely. So you have Nahal Mishmar. If that's a burial good, this is extraordinary, more than 400 copper artifacts. In other burials, we have nothing. You saw the burial of nine individuals. There was really nothing associated with those individuals. The Pekin ossuaries, though, give us an insight to just how elaborate some of these secondary uh, mortuary containers really were. Um, we knew about this before Pekin was discovered and, uh, in the 90s, but nothing quite as elaborate as this site. And so you can see how this one, the one that I call the scream, has got a very clearly delineated face. So the, uh, the ossuary we saw earlier just had a simple nose, and maybe kind of a headdress. And that was typical of most uh, ossuaries. This, uh, Picking gave us an insight, sort of gave us motifs and even applique features that we'd never seen before. So the, the scream has got very clear eyes, very clear mouth. This was not, not something we'd seen before. Even more remarkable was this one that has some sort of strange headgear on it. I mean, these really are not ears. If you could see the side view, you can kind of see how these things protrude out. It almost looks like they're wearing one of those old aviator um, he, you know, hats. Um, and even, even has a snout that looks very unhuman-like, um, more like a baboon or dog snout, uh, and uh, even has arms and fingers, something we'd never seen before on any of these burial containers, so something quite, quite different. This, this burial, Pekin Cave, had over 400 individuals estimated in it and hundreds of these ossuaries. It's not yet published. Um, luckily, Israel's a small archaeological community, and so we all talk. And when I was there working on my dissertation, they had all of this stuff spread out in their halls. It was so much of it, they couldn't just keep it in a room. They couldn't, nobody could keep it hidden if they wanted to. So in trying to put it together, it was everywhere all over the antiquities department. So you just walk in and you see these amazing heads and pieces of containers being reconstructed by people. Fascinating stuff. The site also included steatite beads, um, some very elaborate basalt bowls like the examples you've already seen, one ivory figurine, and some metal objects. So the, this Picayune assemblage really clearly extended the Calcolithic reach even further to the north, much, much further than anything we'd known before. And of course, as I mentioned, the ossuaries included motifs that we'd never seen before, these modeled three-dimensional heads and arms and mouths. In other lectures, I've discussed the varied and often rich burial practices during the Calcolithic. So rather than risk terrible redundancy, I only wanted to emphasize the, the elaborate nature of these funerary practices. And at the beginning of the, oh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot that I had even more images of the Peking assemblage, yet another ossuary, um, and one of the vessels that has, this thing stands about that high, 
and has um, sort of like the fenestrated stand bowls on it. And some of them had skulls in it, as far as they could tell. In most cases, they couldn't tell because things were broken and smashed and covered up. But a few of these actually still had human skulls in them. So clearly part of the, the ritual equipment um, for the burials at Picayune. Ah, uh, yes, and then this is the creepy twins. Um, <laughs> Finally, um, Nahalkana. This is the only burial cave to date that has actually been worked at with archaeologists and spelunkers. And it was the spelunkers who found, of course, not the archaeologists, who found the cave site and worked together to actually investigate the cave site without benefit of a bulldozer or backhoe or anything. And so in this site, it's an elaborate deep cave. You can see here, there's a, I've, I've remade their map. You can see where the different ossuaries are and where the human remains are. So even though it's a deep karstic cave, it nevertheless was rather disturbed. Things have been sort of knocked around. Things are not clear. You can't say, oh, this individual was found in this ossuary, or this ossuary with female characteristics had a female in it. We've never had the benefit of that kind of um, uh, resolution in the archaeological record in any of these caves, but at least in this one, it wasn't actually ripped open by a bulldozer. And luckily, uh, one of the things that was discovered were these gold and electrum rings found in one of the crevices, what they call the passage, clearly with, you know, nearby some of the ossuaries and burials, but not in one of them, not right next to it. This is remarkable. And I, I know that some of my colleagues are still a little suspicious. What's this gold doing in the Calcolithic? There's never been any gold found before, none. And th these are not bracelets. They're too small. Again, it's a museum photograph, and so there's no, um, there's no scale on it. But they're quite small, so they're too small for anybody's wrists. And you can see that they're sort of hammered. They're, they're pretty because they're gold, but they're not really finely finished in the sense that it's an object of decoration. Uh, the suspicion, or at least the, the, the archaeologists who discovered them, have suggested that they were um, um, ingots, some, some way of actually putting them to move them. And, and from Egyptian tomb contexts that date, I forget now, 2,000 years later, something like that, like n not even close, not even in the ballpark of the Calcolithic, we do have very similar objects that are being demonstrated on long sticks being brought by Nubians to the king in Egypt. So we do know about these, but the, the, the time period, the chronology doesn't work at all. We also, gold is very difficult to trace. So the copper, we can at least start working on trace elemental analysis and posit this or you know, eliminate that source, this source possible, eliminate that source. Gold, no chance. It's not so simple. And so we don't know where the gold's coming from. The two closest possibilities, Azerbaijan and Nubia, modern day Sudan, both pretty far away. Given the, the likelihood that there's some Egyptian con connections with, with shell, steatite, beads that we discovered in, in uh, Palestine, also uh, were probably coming from Egypt. Given that connection, the more likely connection seems to, the more likely source seems to be Nubia. Um, but as far as pinpointing it scientifically, we're, we haven't been able to, and it doesn't seem like we'll be able to any, anytime soon. So at the beginning of the lecture, I suggested that the rich copper hoard found at Nahal Mishmar was funerary in nature. And then there was the pilgrimage site of Gilat. And that also seemed to have human burials as a key function of the site. Now, whether those sites are fully accepted as mortuary, they're probably related to ritual practices. Other mortuary sites um, are undisputed, of course, such as Nahal Kana and Pekin. I mean, these are ritual, mortuary ritual sites. There are many other examples, of course, but the central point here is that during the Calcolithic, we have ample examples of ritual sites, and yet these include objects that are really not standardized, and the, even the architecture, the sites themselves, they're not standardized to the point that we could call them something like temples. We, we really avoid using that term because temples are something that are codified and standardized. You can start looking at them and understanding what functioned as what. We don't have that in the Calcolithic, not, not yet, and probably never will. It doesn't really seem to have that formalization. Much of this ritual, though, clearly seems related to the proper disposal of the, the people's loved ones. Secondary burial rites meant the preparation for reburial allowed time for creation of ritually charged objects to go with that deposition, much of it the reburial, which we would know that you're going to do perhaps on some sort of calendrical plan or some sort of agricultural calendrical uh, time, time frame. So in the Calcolithic landscape, the cemeteries, the sanctuaries, the caches and the caves were all intertwined to form the nexus of ritual practice. 
that address these central human concerns of death and the regeneration of life. A ritual economy such as that of Calglithic can motivate individual skilled craftspeople to create these socially valued goods. Rather than emphasize the political aspirations of a few over the necessity of many, ritual acts such as feasting and the exchange of social valuables builds prestige, but it also provides the opportunity for individual ritual participation. So I would argue that the perspective of a ritual economy encourages us to consider how values and beliefs motivate economic choices rather than the reverse. So ritual as the basic social act can actually drive economic production. And so with that, I'd like to leave it there um, and uh, give you all a chance to ask any questions or challenge this, this idea, uh, whatever you like. So thank you very much. Give us something else to look at. Here we go. <laughs> Carol? Um, I'm assuming that the horde found in the Elot cave was wrapped in one single, as one single unit, and perhaps just one offering. Wow. You know, you really got to the heart of a problem. <laughs> the the, the Nahal Mishmar hoard, the, the, the copper hoard found in the crevice, um, was of course found, it does seem like it was one deposit all together at the same time in that mat. But when they dated the mat, there turned out to be something of a problem that I really don't know what the answer is. And that is, is that despite using very high precision, I think they were dated at the Oxford Labs, one of the world's best mass spectroscopy labs, they came out with different dates. And the dates, okay, well that's, that's normal with, with radiocarbon dating, you don't expect to come up with exactly the same date. They're probability statements anyway. But these dates vary by like hundreds of years. So that part of the mat seems to be earlier than that part of the mat. And so how to interpret that, I don't really know. Uh, possibly it's because different pieces of mat had been sitting around for a while and were woven together and put together as one. Um, and it's not in such great condition that you can sort of spread it all out and say, ah, oh, yes, this part's the, as, as far as I understand it, you, you, it would be too difficult to, it would be too detrimental to the map to sort of stretch it out and try to say this part was earlier and that part, you know, the, the, these different pieces were put together. So I, I don't know what the answer to that is. It does seem like it was one event, but the mat itself seems like it may have been the result of several different events or several different manufacturing processes, which is a little, a little odd. Hard to know how to, yeah. How if it was perhaps reused and rewoven generation after generation and perhaps reused because ritually it was such an important art? Right, this certainly seems possible. In fact, it seems like one of the only explanations is that I can come up with. The, the, uh, the problem is, would the mat really survive so well? I mean, certainly in a dry cave, thousands of years it preserved, but that's because nobody touched it for those many thousands of years, and because it was in an environment where there is very little, um, it was almost an anaerobic environment, that's part of what helped preserve it, of course. If you had people touching it and, and moving it around and attaching things to it and taking parts off, I would have thought that eventually it would have all just sort of disintegrated, but maybe not. Yeah. And how about the examination of the artifacts in the, in the, in the mat, did they appear to have been uh, added to and like design changes over generations? I, I don't know that we can talk about uh, over generations, but what we can say is that those different copper items are not all made the same. There's no standardization. Yes, there's an idea of what a mace head looks like, and all mace heads, many hundreds of them, look pretty similar, but they're not exactly the same, and they're clearly making a different mold for each one. And uh, so it's, it's not um, sort of a efficiency production line kind of idea. Um, somebody, one of the theories that was posited about these was that they were, that there was a deposit of artifacts that were no longer um, useful, that they had passed their, their sort of their sacred time. And so of course, what do you do with a sacred object? Well, you don't exactly just chuck it in the bin. You put it in some sort of um, deposit where sacred objects go. Um, but the problem with that is that most of these are in pretty good nick. They're really in pretty good shape. And so it doesn't really seem like they would have expired in their, in their utility. They're still beautiful. I mean, as you saw, they still shine up wonderfully 6,000 years later. So um, but it doesn't really seem like they were broken or would, be, would have been disposed of for that reason. Yeah, Mari. Well, I'm 
Um, the, the excavators of the Gilat site would argue that there, were, that there was a priestly class, or, or some priests. Um, and there, there is one site called En Gedi, um, which we'll hopefully take a short hike up to during the trip um, in two weeks. And En Gedi is one that we would all agree, I think all of the archaeologists who work in Calcolithic and even other periods would agree that that does seem like a sanctuary site, a pilgrimage site, not, nothing but. There's no residence there, really. Um, at the same time, the, the difference in burial seems to suggest difference, but difference that we can't really associate with hierarchies. So that's still problematic. And part of the reason is when you find these wonderful cave burials with all the um, marvelous ossuaries and great artifacts, you can't really say which artifact went with who or whether it went with several people. So you have secondary burials. They're very often grouped anyway. So already you've lost that. It's just not nice and tidy like those pre-dynastic Egyptian or Egyptian burials where you have individual lots of pots, pallets, other good stuff in one single articulated burial. You have secondary burial. It sort of messes up your evidence. Then it's put together with some objects. And then the cave collapses and things get broken. Or people return and bury some more things and sort of push those things out of the way because they don't know those people. They, you know, it's a generation later. They don't remember who that is. And so they're going to focus on their burial. Um, so we, we really are not convinced that we are there yet. Um, and so I could still see being able to posit that some of these burials and secondary burials were being done sort of on a group basis, a, a corporate group, um, a lineage, uh, that you would do it maybe even on an annual basis or something, and include some nice artifacts, but maybe not for one individual, maybe for individuals who you collected up as a group for you know, a secondary burial, right? Say, when the harvest is done, when you have the time to take care of this kind of problem. So. Right. Right. Exactly. That kind of yeah. That's exactly kind of ethnographic analogy from Madagascar that that, I, that makes me think of this. Yeah. So it's clearly when you look at the copper objects. Wow. Okay. This stuff is pretty impressive, and the sophisticated technology is beyond what anybody's doing in in, in other areas. Um, at the same time, in most cases they're not really associated clearly with an individual in a single burial. So it's it's problematic for asserting that there's a hierarchy there. Just generally, um, in these ossuaries, whether they were primary or secondary, are skulls generally there? Yes, the secondary burials generally include uh, the skulls and long bones. Um, but they don't seem to be too picky about trying to collect every single bone. Yeah, right. And um, the the problem, of course, is that when you find an articulated burial, or at the, at the site of Gilat where you find disturbed burials, it's difficult to know, well, was that just simply disturbed because somebody came along later and they didn't know somebody was buried there, or is that because they came back and collected certain pieces? And when you find an articulated burial, is that because that person was different, or they, they like weren't as important, they don't rank a secondary burial, or is it because in the archaeological record, whatever for whatever reason, Nobody came back. They would have been, had the secondary burial, but it just never happened for that person. It's very difficult to know these things. It's, it's very tough to tease it out. So it's, it's difficult to know whether or not ultimately most people, except for infants, would have gotten a secondary burial, or whether or not there's really a distinction that some people get a secondary burial and some people don't for whatever reason. Yeah. So that's also a problem with trying to understand hierarchy and status distinctions within the period. Yeah. Any other we were looking at the original artifacts. Is there evidence in your day-to-day -day artifacts or versions that, that those also came from far away? Mean, the materials of those are made of, and those of all the those also that's a, that's a very good question. There are, you know, the, the pottery is primarily being made locally. But we do have some evidence for, just recently, a, um, a French woman by the name of uh, Valentine Roule published an article suggesting that there are some pots coming from a site in the Jordan Valley um, and then found in the Negev. So there may be some specialization developing on a, maybe something of a minor scale, but not everybody's making 
exclusively their own local pottery, for instance. Um, such as, for, for pottery specifically, you mean, or just tools? Yeah, I mean, again, the, for some of the flint tools, which, which is what I've studied for years, uh, there, there are most of the tools locally produced, just, but not all. There are those that seem to be coming even from some distance. So there are these things called uh, flint tabular scrapers, and they're very, they're, they're large fan scrapers that might be the size of my hand or even slightly larger, very flat, no thicker than my hand or even less. And those are not, uh, the, the, the flint to make those is not available locally at pretty much any calculated site. People seem to be going some distance or trading with pastoralists who know where to get this and who are making these and then bringing them back. We think we have identified some of the sites, uh, some of my colleagues have, not, not myself, in Jordan where they're making these, which is very far away from most calculific sites. So there is an element of a little bit of trade in tools and pottery, um, uh, something of an exotic nature or fancier things that aren't just ritual objects, perhaps. You talked about the poor nutrition of a group of skeletons in one area. Um, is there any kind of, um, has enough analysis been done that can say that any particular site has a consistent nutritional history or confirmation? Are they the same people, the same tribe, or visitors? There, there, there hasn't really been a lot done, and um, now the, the political situation within sort of the antiquities authority vis-a-vis -vis the religious authorities in Israel um, is causing problems for any future physical remains. The physical remains are being turned over to the religious right who have been reburying them. So even though they're not, it's not a Jewish population, I think, fair enough to say. And, uh, but. But there have been some analyses done. And so, for example, at the site of Gilat, the, the um, evidence for, um, well, a number of different maladies, many of them related probably to poor nutrition as well as possibly malaria, various forms of, of, of anemia that suggest that the population's not eating that well. That seems to be pretty typical of the period. From what we know of other areas, other sites, it's not unusual. It's not unusual with these early agricultural populations. Yeah, you're producing more, but you're producing more grains, and grains are not a good source of protein. Um, it's just a good source of sugar to keep people going. There are animals, but of course people are trying to um, create cheese and yogurt and um, keep their animals going for the secondary products to be able to use the hair for making wool and for, the, for making butter and yogurt and cheese. And uh, so probably people aren't eating that much meat all the time. And uh, so, so nutrition doesn't seem to be that great in the calculative period at all. Most of the populations that we know of have not shown very good evidence. The site that was associated with feasting yeah. had Um, I believe so, and I don't think that that was, it wasn't really published in detail in that article, so I think that we'll get more, at, because I think the preservation was quite good at that site, and uh, clearly the animal remains have been partially studied, which is how they knew that there was a lot of pig being consumed. Uh, but the botanical remains, I don't think there's really anything published in detail. Uh, so, but I think there will be. I think the preservation was good, so there will be in the future, I think. It would be very interesting to know, um, you know, just, just what it is, whether or not it's, it's uh, wheat or if it's, you know, if it's emmer wheat or if it's something else. So very, very important question. Yeah. 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 It was unique in that area. Um, the, the question where this technology came from is still an open one, uh, but it does seem like there was comparable technology in, and it's sort of stretching outside of my realm of, of good close knowledge, but I think that further north in Iran um, and possibly in Syria, there was, and this may be the source of some of the copper, that there was comparable technology about the same time. Yeah, I think so, but I'm not even certain. You, you started this by saying that this was an idea of yours. It's an argument that you're making and developing yeah. um, in terms of ritual drive in the economy. And so I'm just wondering, is, are you finding any colleagues that are arguing with this point, that 
not agree with this? Um, I, I certainly will, when I, <laughs> um, and, and I'll tell you why. This sort of comes out of looking at, with, with my colleague and something of a mentor, a person who was on my dissertation committee years ago and still a, you know, a friend, who was the proponent of the idea that the Calcolithic was where we see the first chiefdoms in the region, where we see the first development of elites and, and uh, inherited status, thus chiefdoms. And I'm arguing that to some extent that might be true, but I am minimizing it. And I am suggesting that uh, contrary to what he has offered for the reason for that, which was that it's risk management, that there are more people and there's more conflict over land, over farming land versus those who are pastoralists. And so out of that arose the need for somebody who's sort of a good leader, a good manager of diminishing resources. It's, um, it was a, a pretty not unusual argument in, in the 80s. And, uh, and, and a, you know, something of a pretty convincing one. It, it, but, we, but a lot of the evidence for chiefdoms isn't really there. The, the lack of monumental architecture, the lack of burials with individuals with a lot of the goods. We certainly have the goods. We certainly have impressive artifacts. We just simply don't have them associated with elite residences, elite precincts, and elite individual. We have lots of burials, but we don't have the evidence to suggest a burial went with a particular type of artifact. So the, the idea of an inherited status, which is fundamental to arguing for this elite chiefdom model, I, I would argue isn't really there. And instead, I would suggest that the, the rituals that would have still been part of a chiefdom uh, are part of what drove this, this increasing economic intensification. Um, it, it, you know, I'm trying to avoid something of a tautology, something of a chicken and an egg argument, but, um, but I do see this as a lot of this equipment seems to be ritually affiliated and not in any sort of sense standardized efficiency creation of you know, lots of artifacts that are similar. Yeah. But yeah, you were writing a board of the people yeah. outfits and came and discovered the date and skeletons. Right. Well, there were five skeletons. The, the problem is these were excavated in the 60s. And when excavated, I don't think they were really looking for anything calcolithic. They, that's just what they happened to find. I think they were more interested in like text, scrolls, and stuff in the Dead Sea areas. <laughs> and and um, so the details of where things were and where the burials were are a bit sketchy, and we're never going to be able to resolve that because even when you go to the original Hebrew publication, then it was translated to English, you don't sort out the problems. So um, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. But you're right. If that is a mortuary assemblage, and if there's only, say, one individual, or even if there's only a couple of individuals, that would argue for somebody, if, if you're going to argue that that's really a mortuary assemblage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If your hypothesis is correct, that one of those chief driven societies that you were talking about, when would you say that you're if If not now, then when yeah, would something? Um, probably in the next period, in the, in the early bronze, when you start to see really sort of larger urban centers. Uh, you, oddly, much of this cool stuff that you see from the Calcolithic, the, 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 the ossuaries, the copper, the ivory, all this inventive sort of creative stuff, the, the wall murals, that disappears in the early bronze. There's still metallurgy, but it's really functional. We need awls and we need a few axes, and that's all that's being made, no more copper scepters, no more copter mace heads. It's not that the technology disappeared. People still knew how to make this stuff. Maybe it was a, a break with the providers of the ore, so that might have been a problem. So, you know, some sort of disruption in the trade, and uh, if in doubt, blame it on the Egyptians, right? But there's, um, it's not clear um, why that all sort of fell apart. All of this, what I would argue, is this ritual practice that's got so much um, uh, fancy non-local goods involved with it really sort of disappears. And yet, there are still people there. They're living in larger, sort of something close to urban communities. The site of Arad in the northern Negev is a great example, where there's actually a wall around the town, a nice thick wall. It's not clear that they needed to defend themselves, but they had a, they had a big thick wall. And so things really did change rather dramatically. And um, it does seem like there are people starting to manage sort of making a large urban like wall reservoir at, at towns like Arad. So I would suggest a little bit later. But something very different happened, something that was not, I would not argue that's ritually driven in that, in that next period. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your questions. Thank you. Yeah.